so we've just done Rushkoff and um, the two people we talked about Pavlov. All right, so now we're gonna do these two. Again, it's gonna be two separate videos. They're not maybe particularly related, or maybe they are not. Anyway, one is about something that I need to take much more seriously, but I don't even know whether I sort of can. Anyway, so th the first one we're gonna do is that one. And out of all the S's in here, this is the one that's most like, oh shit. Like, this is, this is something that I need to just really learn from. Okay. The other one is how to have a good idea. And, okay, whatever. Natural selection is simple, but the systems it shapes are unimaginably complex. Randolph Nessie, professor of psychiatry and psychology, University of Michigan, co-author with George C. Williams, Why We Get Sick, The New Science of Darwinian Medicine. Oh, and this is, of course, from This Explains Everything. Okay, so this one is like four pages. The principle of natural selection is exceedingly simple. If some individuals in a population have a heritable trait associated with having more offspring, that trait will usually become more common in the population over the generations. The products of natural selection are vastly complex. They are not merely complicated in the way that machines are complicated. They are organically complex in ways that are fundamentally different from any product of design. This makes them difficult for human minds to fully describe or comprehend. So we use that grand human gambit for understanding, a metaphor. In this case, the body as machine. This metaphor makes it easy to portray the systems that mediate cell division, immune responses, glucose regulation, and all the rest, using boxes for the parts and arrows to indicate what causes what. Such diagrams summarize important information in ways we can grasp. Teachers teach them. Students dutifully memorize them. But they fundamentally misrepresent the nature of organic complexity. As John Scott Haldane noted in a prescient 1917 book, a living organism has in truth but little resemblance to an ordinary machine. Machines are designed. They have discrete parts with specific functions and most remain intact when turned off. Individual machines are manufactured following identical copies of a single blueprint. In contrast, organisms evolve. They have components with indistinct boundaries and multiple functions that interact with myriad other parts and the environment to create self-sustaining reproducing systems whose survival requires the constant activity and cooperation of thousands of interdependent subsystems. Individual organisms develop from unique combinations of genes interacting with one another and with environments to create phenotypes, no two of which are identical. Thinking about the body as a machine was a grand advance in the 16th century when it offered an alternative to vitalism and vague notions of the life force. Now it's outmoded. It distorts our view of biological systems by fostering a tendency to think of them as simpler and more sensibly designed than they are. Experts know better. They recognize that the mechanisms regulating blood clotting are represented only crudely by the neat diagrams medical students memorize. Most molecules in the clotting system interact with many others. Experts on the amygdala know that it has many functions, not just one or two, and they are mediated by scores of pathways to other brain loci. Serotonin exists not mainly to regulate mood and anxiety. It is essential to vascular tone, intestinal motility, and bone de deposition. Leptin is not mainly a fat hormone. It has many functions, performing different ones at different times, even in the same cell. The reality of organic systems is vastly untidy. If only their parts were all distinct with specific functions for each. Alas, these systems are not like machines. Our human minds have as little intuitive feeling for organic complexity as they do for quantum physics.
Recent progress in genetics confronts the problem. Naming genes according to postulated functions is as natural as defining chairs and boats by their functions. If each gene were a box on a blueprint labeled with its specific function, biology would be so much more tractable. However, it is increasingly clear that most traits are influenced by many genes and most genes influence many traits. For instance, about 80% of the variation in human height is accounted for by genetic variation. It would seem straightforward to find the responsible genes. But looking for them has revealed that the 180 loci with the largest effects together account for only about 10% of the phenotypic variation. Recent findings in medical genetics are more discouraging. Just a decade ago, hope was high that we would soon find the variations that account for highly heritable diseases such as schizophrenia and autism. But scanning the entire genome has revealed that there are no common alleles with large effects on these diseases. Some say we should have known. Natural selection would, after all, tend to eliminate alleles that cause disease. But thinking about the body as a machine aroused unrealistic hopes. The grand vision for some neuroscientists is to trace every molecule and pathway to characterize all circuits in order to understand how the brain works. Molecules, loci, and pathways do serve differentiated functions. This is real knowledge with great importance for human health. But understanding how the brain works by drawing a diagram that describes all the components and their connections and functions is a dream that may be unfulfillable. The problem is not merely fitting a million items on a page. The problem is that no such diagram can adequately describe the structure of organic systems. They are products of minuscule changes from diverse mutations, migrations, drift, and selection, which develop into systems with incompletely differentiated parts and incomprehensible interconnections, systems that nonetheless work very well indeed. Trying to reverse engineer brain systems focuses important attention on functional significance but it is inherently limited because brain systems were never engineered in the first place. Natural selection shapes systems whose complexity is indescribable in terms satisfying to human minds. Some may feel this is nihilistic. It does discourage hopes for finding simple, specific descriptions for all biological systems. However, recognizing a quest as hopeless is often the key to progress. As Haldane put it, we are thus brought face to face with a conclusion which to the biologist is just as significant and fundamental and just as true to the facts observed as the conclusion that mass persists is to the physicists. The structure of a living organism has no real resemblance in its behavior to that of a machine. In the living organism, the structure is only the appearance given by what seems at first to be a constant flow of specific material beginning and ending in the environment. <clears throat> if bodies are not like machines, what are they like? They are more like Darwin's tangled bank, with its elaborately constructed forms so different from each other and dependent upon each other in so complex a manner. Lovely. But can an ecological metaphor replace the metaphor of body as a machine? Not likely. Perhaps someday understanding how natural selection shapes organic complexity will be so widely and deeply understood that scientists will be able to say, a body is like a living body. And everyone will know exactly what that means. I don't even know what to do with it. I 100% accept it don't know how to integrate that information into my mind. Um, I mean, I guess the goal wouldn't be to try to... It's like trying to imagine the fourth dimension, right? Our brain just didn't evolve for that. Didn't even evolve really to feel like 
it, to have an illusion of being able to 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 visualize the fourth dimension. And I, I, I don't know what to do with this information. I can only see the brain as a machine. Um, I have very faint notions of what he is describing. Um, this untidiness and this playing all these different functions, but yeah, my the way that the human brain is, we talk about functions and structure, right? That's how you understand a thing. So the idea that we can't identify the pieces and the role that they play in like a way that makes sense to the human mind, that just kind of breaks my mind. So I will continue to dis discuss it as using these metaphors because, well, you know, what else are we going to do? Um, so these metaphors of machinery and, you know, wait a minute, or do I, is there a part of this I understand, or is this the illusion finally kicking in? Often when I talk about behavior with people, people talk about the human mind as though like there's this like set of beliefs and then I guess there's like something that comes and like checks these beliefs or these objectives so information or beliefs and objectives or values so that's the two components and like these are like consulted to then produce a sentence a new belief or response whatever um, which is wildly incorrect when in fact, it's much more of, you know, sometimes the, if the belief is, if the belief is some aspect of the belief is connected to the pathway through which the input, like a question passes, then, you know, it will have some influence on the response. Um, I'm just wondering whether, okay, what I'm trying to say is that I sometimes struggle when I'm talking to people and they try to explain behavior as the person wanted to do this. Um, there's always some kind of desire behind every single action. Uh, every time we try to explain behavior, every single time we're like, oh, because the person wanted this, um, which is not how the brain works. The brain, again, and that's why that's why that design thing is resonating with me because like, no, it's not this like, coherent system where desire is the start of everything where it's like desire is just this like constant first cause <clears throat> or that belief is this constant first cause um no it just happens the behavior just like happens and I would be interested in, in understanding which pathways contributed to that happening. So maybe a piece of a desire, a piece of an understanding of something may have contributed. And otherwise, it was just that that pathway is what we, how we evolved to respond, even regardless of whatever our beliefs may be. No, so I don't think I understand. And, uh, and that's really cool to something fun to try to uh, wrap my mind around like the fourth dimension. Okay.